turn to Psalm 107. There we go, Levi. Here, click on, got some power now. Psalm 107. Let's find a place there. And then the hymn book of Israel is the Psalms. All of these were, and being a musician, I've often wondered uh, how the melody goes on uh, a lot of these. I'd love to, when we get to heaven, I'm going to ask David to uh, fire up the harp there and, uh, and tell me how these went on uh, all these psalms. Uh, they're, they're meant to be put to music. And, uh, of course, we studied them in Scripture, the lyrics of these psalms, but they're just wonderful. And, and you know, I think God, uh, just a side note here, I think God made David the way that he was. Uh, all of the songs that touch our heart most, you'll find that the author, the writer of that song, he, he was going through some some difficulty or some uh, great some great experience, and the song is a reflection of what he experienced, and he's just sharing that through music. And there's no other way that hearts can be touched like music and like songs. And so David, he not only was he a warrior and a, a, a man of the battlefield, but also a, a very emotional man. And then when things were not going well, he would write about it, he'd give us a psalm. Things were going great, he would give us a psalm. And so that's why I think that so many times in our lives, uh, good times and bad times, we turn to the psalms, God's people turn to the psalms because we really, we do identify, we, we, we connect with the Psalms. We're going to look at Psalm 107 here this morning. The things that we long for. Psalm 107. Let's read the first three verses together. In Psalm 107, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord, that's us, we've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You redeemed? Say it. Amen. Whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered them out of the lands from the east, from the west, from the north. Yeah, the Yankees can be saved too. From the north, I'm a testimony. And from the south. Hey, y'all. God's love, it accepts us. That's, what, that's what's so wonderful about God's love. And God's love. It accepts us without reservation. No conditions. You don't have to shape up in order to be loved by God. God accepts us without reservation. Now, what is acceptance? One, one writer in Eternity Magazine had this to say, acceptance means that you are valuable just as you are. It allows you to be the real you. You aren't forced into someone else's idea of who you really are. It means that your ideas are taken seriously since they reflect you. You can talk about how you feel inside and why, why you feel that way, and someone really cares. Acceptance means that you can try out your ideas without being shot down. You can even express heretical thoughts and discuss them with intelligent questioning because you feel safe. No one will pronounce judgment on you even though they don't agree with you. That doesn't mean that uh, you'll never be corrected or shown to be wrong. It simply means that it's safe to be you. And no one will destroy you out of prejudice or pride. Now this kind of unqualified acceptance, it's what the psalmist calls the mercy of the Lord which 
which endures forever. Now the Hebrew word that's translated as mercy here, it means eager and ardent desire, favor, goodliness, merciful, pity, and loving kindness. Here's what I want us to understand. No matter how deep our dissatisfaction in life runs, no matter how heavy our sin chains seem, no matter how painful our heart wounds throb, no matter how restless our weary soul, through his love, God accepts us just as we are and wonderfully works to give us just what we long for. Can you say amen right there? Amen. Now after verse 1 through 3 in Psalm 107, the rest of the psalm gives us four testimonials, so to speak, of God's acceptance, his unconditional acceptance. And these four testimonials actually reveal to us what we as human beings, every generation, truly long for the most. I want you to look at verse number 4, Psalm 107. Right? <laughs> verse, yeah, verse 4. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. The first thing we deeply long for is satisfaction. Satisfaction in our lives, in our relationship, in all that we, we long deeply for satisfaction. And the psalmist here starts out by talking about we who are dissatisfied with life. I mean, we wander about from place to place, from job to job, sometimes even from marriage to marriage. We are filled with questions, seeking to find where the real answer lies. We, we find ourselves looking, desperately looking for that something. We can't put our finger on it. We tried this, that, and the other. Never seems to work out, but there's something out there that is missing in my life. I need it. We, we end up desperately looking for that something. We wander in the wilderness of experiences on a lonely road to nowhere. That's what he says in verse number four. We wandered in the wilderness in a solitary or lonely way. They found no city to dwell in. We never find anything that lasts. No lasting excitement, no genuine security. And, and that's pictured here in, in this, uh, in speaking about this city, because the city always has two qualities about it, excitement and security. In the Bible times, the city was where everything exciting was happening. I mean, it was the city with its great fortress walls which gave that secure protection. And actually, God has designed all of us at one point, ultimately, that we should live in cities. Remember in Hebrews chapter 11, where the Bible says, Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. So we're ultimately designed. Now, the problem is that while we're wandering around on these lonely roads and in this life, Nothing fills in the blank, unsatisfied space inside our heart and inside our soul. There's just nothing that can fill it. Look at verse number, look at verse number five again. Hungry and thirsty. Constantly hungering for something different, thirsting for something more. Their soul fainted in them. Now this is this, this is the testimonial, all right? And then we're told how to find true satisfaction. 
Look at verse number 6. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city of habitation. They could live there, dwell there, be secure there, and be satisfied there. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he, what's that word, congregation? Thanks to God. Everybody, say it out loud. Thanks to God. He satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. See here, we're, we're told how to find satisfaction. The answer, they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. Verse number six again. They cry unto the Lord in their trouble and he delivers them out of their distresses. You see, the Lord accepts us just as we are, just where we are. Here's a testimony. Did, did God say, tough luck, you got yourself into this mess, you figure it out? No, that's not what he said. When, when they, in their trouble, cried unto the Lord, you can see all those, those verses, verse 6 through 9, God delivered them, God led them, God filled them, God satisfied them. And, and then the psalmist said, this is good. This stuff, this is good stuff. This is where we want to praise the wonderful works of God to the children of men. That's why he says in verse number 8, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Because here we are, wandering around in a lonely road, going nowhere, finding no security, no peace of mind, no contentment, no satisfaction, hungering and thirsting in our soul until it faints, not knowing what to do. And then when we cry unto the Lord, he doesn't shut us. He doesn't turn us away. Instead, he delivers us and leads us and guides us and fills us. And most of all, he satisfies us. Say amen. 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 I want us to praise the Lord by repeating verse 1 together out loud. Let's read it all together out loud. Put it up on there, verse 1, please, on the screen. Everybody say it together. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. Glory to God. He satisfies by bringing us back into the good and the right way. See that? Verse number seven. Verse number seven. And he led them forth by the right way. He got us back on the right path. That's what God does. See, some of us have had this experience. We were dissatisfied, uncertain, wandering. We were hungry and thirsty for a satisfying life, but we could never find it. We tried everything this world has to offer, and finally, when we reached the bottom, we cried to the Lord in our trouble, and when he, we did, he heard us. Amen. Now, maybe not suddenly, Maybe not instantaneously, but gradually he began to lead us to a place where we could find satisfaction. Yeah. Where we could be excited about living. Where we could be find adequacy and power and, and security. And the one factor which reaches and holds them in the psalmist's day and us in our day is the unqualified acceptance of God's mercy and love. You can always come home to the Father. Say amen. 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 Unqualified acceptance. Oh, how we long to be 
satisfied with our lives. Just have that approval, that sense of satisfaction that we are what we were created to be in Christ Jesus. Amen. Through his love, God accepts us just as we are and wonderfully works to give us just what we long for. And we long deeply for satisfaction. I want us to look at this next testimonial because we long deeply for freedom. Look at verse number 10. Look at verse number 10, Psalm 107. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned, that's an old Elizabethan English word we don't use very much anymore, it means despised, and they despised the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. If you haven't learned this lesson at all, or if you learned it and forgot it, as Christians, as children of the Lord, rebellion against God always imprisons us. It, it, it shackles us. It, it holds us back. I mean, we think it's the opposite. Uh, you know, we throw off the restraints of God. We don't want to live by God's book. I mean, that's an old, dusty book that has nothing to do with life. Now we want to live by a, a book like the Bible. So we throw off restraints of God and we deceive ourselves into thinking that this will make us free. We don't have to do what he tells us to. But actually, in truth, when we think we are free, we're made to sit in darkness and gloom. This is what he's saying in, in verse 10. That's why he says, such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron. See, darkness and gloom, whenever you read that in the Bible, it's always a figure in the Bible of hopeless ignorance. You just, we cannot figure out what is wrong with us. We can't figure out what's missing. We can't figure out what needs to be done to help us to be satisfied and to help us be truly free. Our lives are filled with gloom. We have no hope. We have no idea what the blazes is the matter. Not only that, but we're afflicted and chained. What the last part of verse 10 is saying, he said we're, we are bound in afflictions and iron. I don't have to tell you this. When we throw off the book of God and we decide not to live according to the, the, the Bible, we're, we are held prisoner by certain habits and ideas and thoughts and, and attitudes that hold us in an iron grip of enslavement. And, and no matter how hard we try, we just can't seem to break the clamp, despite the misery that it's causing us. And we see the misery that it causes us, but we keep on doing it. Many things can do that. I don't have to tell you this. Drugs, drugs can do it. It's not unusual to read the newspaper how some youth uh, gets a hold of drugs and it gets a hold of them in, in the grip of his life and finds to his dismay that he cannot break loose and finally after a while he either overdoses or kills himself or herself. Right. Wrongful sex can also do it. People can be so given over to sexual promiscuity that they just seem to cannot break free of that habit alone. They know it's wrecking their homes. They know it's wrecking their lives. They just seem to cannot stop. A bitter attitude can do it. There are many people that never give way to alcohol, never give way to drugs, never give way to sex or anything like that, but who nevertheless
us are bound in irons because of a bitter or resentful spirit, an unforgiving heart, a critical spirit. And these are just a sampling. I could go on and on and on. These are just a sampling of some of the conditions of our life that, that the psalmist is describing here. And it certainly causes us to be to have that sense of confinement that we're being pressured. You, ever, you know, you talk about the pressures of life. Just the pressures of life. We want to be free. Amen. The cause of our bondage is clearly revealed here in verse number 11. Because they rebelled against the words of God. And they despised the counsel of the most so we don't like we don't like what God says about our life. We don't like what God says about how we should conduct ourselves and how we should speak and how we should carry ourselves. We we don't like what God says about life, and so we decide to live as we feel like. And we reject the counsel of the Most High, and we turn every one of us to our own way, as the prophet said. The result: our disobedience seems to make it a job to live. It's, it's just a labor, a hard, laborious job just to live life, just to get up the next day and do what we got to do. It's, it just it feels heavy and laborious. But then we're told how to find true freedom. Look at verse number 13. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death, and he broke their bands in half or in sunder. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he has broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in half or asunder. We're told how to be truly free. The answer, cry unto the Lord in your trouble. And the Lord accepts us. Say amen. amen. The Lord accepts us as we are, just where we are. Did God say in this testimonial here in Psalm 107, did God say, no, you made your bed, now you got to lie in it. You took your own course, now it's too late. No, it's not what God told the guy here in the Psalms. No, God saved them, God brought them out, God broke their chains. Say amen. Amen. These are the wonderful works of God to the children of of men. I want us all praise the Lord and praise God by repeating verse 1 together again. Let's, let's go back to verse number 1. Get it up on the screen for us so we can all say it out loud together. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. This is Thanksgiving week. We want to give thanks to God, amen? Amen. I mean, I feel sorry for the thing, for the atheists. Who can they give thanks to? There's nobody for them to give thanks to. We give thanks to our Heavenly Father who has provided all of our abundance, amen? Amen. Give thanks. Oh, if we're struggling with bad habits, bad ideas, thoughts, attitudes, that we, that we have not been able to break. There's a power that can do what no psychologist or psychiatrist, no social worker, or any other well-intentioned person can do for us. The power of God can set us free. Thank you, Jesus. You believe that? Amen. The power of God can set us free. Remember what, what Charles Wesley wrote? He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Say amen right there. Amen. That's good stuff. Oh, how we long to be free. And through his love, God accepts.
accepts us just as we are, just where we are, and wonderfully works to give us just what we long for. And we deeply long for satisfaction. And we long deeply for freedom. I want you to look at this third testimonial. We long deeply for healing. Look at verse number 17. Look at verse number 17, Psalm 107. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are sick and afflicted. Their soul abhors all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. See, both the body and soul require good food to be healthy. Say amen. Amen. There's some guys down at the fitness center, and they all the time, you know, they're all puffed up, muscles done doing things. And I said, I said, you know what? You can take care of that physical body, but you need to take care of your physical, physical spiritual body too. Take care of that spiritual body. Well, let's take care of the physical body. You know, we're all worried about vitamins and eating right, keep the calories and everything like that. Take care of the physical body. Yeah, that, that, that's a good thing. But don't neglect taking care of your spiritual bodies. Amen. Amen. Because without good food for our soul, we become emotionally sick, spiritually sick. And since our body, soul, and spirit are all connected, it'll eventually affect our physical body. If, if we are dysfunctional, we don't want healthy things. It's not on our mind. We don't want good food. We do not want the nourishment of meat, potatoes. No, we want whipped cream and carrots. We don't want to read the Bible. We, we want something that sets us tingling and panders to the lust of our flesh. And the result is we get worse and worse. And when we are emotionally distraught, <coughs> that's when we're unable to handle life. Right. And life just seems to be overwhelming. I just can't take it. I just can't take it. We're fearful, nervous, <coughs> anxious, afraid to go out and face life as it is. And the cause of this dysfunction is seen in verse 17 many times. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Dr. Henry Brandt, he's a Christian psychologist, and he once told of a woman who came to him in his office for counseling. She was in deep emotional difficulty, and he watched her and listened for, as she talked for over half an hour, just straight, he didn't say a word, just listened. Half an hour or more. And finally he said to her, you're not a very peaceful woman, are you? And she said, well, why do you say that? <laughs> he said, well, I've been noticing you chewing on the edge of your handkerchief and upset and distraught and you tell me about all these terrible things that happen to you all the time, even though you're a Christian, you're, you're not a very peaceful woman, are you? She wanted to know what that had to do with anything. And he said, well, you know, in Isaiah, the Bible says, there is no peace, says my God, to the wicked. <laughs> so she said right away, sat up straight, are you calling me wicked? He said, well, it's, it's wicked for a man to take a gun into a bank and rob it of $100,000. But if a little boy takes a nickel out of his mother's 
purse when she isn't looking. That, that's wicked too. And, and in each case, guess what? That little boy or that grown man, there's, there's no peace to the wicked. So if you do not have any peace, it's likely because you are wicked. <laughs> but then she softened and little by little he began to show this woman that indeed her troubles came from sinful habits ideas attitudes, bad attitudes and, th and thoughts and ways and they were actually destroying her and making her sick and dysfunctional and he was able to show that to her. We, we long so to be healed. To be healed. To be whole. And we're actually told how to find that healing. Look at verse 19. Look at verse 19. For the third time, then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. And he saves them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. Say amen. amen. See, we're told. We're told how to find healing. They cried to the Lord in their trouble. And they found out that the Lord accepts us just as we are, just where we are. God does not leave us to writhe in the pain of the consequences of our sin. When we call on him, he sends his word Amen. to heal us. Don't miss that. Verse 20. He sent his word. His word healed them. Delivered them from their destructions. It's the word of God. That's why it's so important to hear it preached. And hear it taught. And to spend time reading and studying. The word brings healing. Because of trouble. They reel 
to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits end. Oh, we so easily, so easily allow the storms of life to unrest our soul, to unsettle us. It's easy to get in trouble at the sea. You have to be out there very long to, to know that the sea is a lot bigger than you are. It's hardly it takes anything to capsize those small sailboat to come to our wits' end. Verse 27, they reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits' end. And then we're told how to find rest. Verse 28, Verse 28, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he brings them out of their distresses. He makes the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet. So he brings them unto their desired haven in a safe harbor. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're going to repeat Psalm 101, 107, verse number 1 again together. As a congregation, we're praising the Lord. Give us verse number 1 again up on the screen, please. Here it comes any second. Stretch. <laughs> Say it together. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord accepts us just as we are, just where we are. And watch carefully. He brings us to our desired haven in verse 30. And in verse 9, he satisfies our longing soul. The Lord of glory can calm the storm, make the waves to cease. He can bring us to a quiet place of rest. These are the wonderful works of God to the children of men. Amen. Now look back at how many times he's, he tells us this. Look at verse 8. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Verse number 15, same thing. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Verse 21, oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And verse 31, oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And now look at the last verse of this psalm. Verse 43. Whoso is wise will observe these things. You'll experience that. You'll see this. And even they shall understand the acceptance Verse 1, all together. Let's stand up and say it together. 
Psalm 107, verse number 1. Everyone standing, we're going to say it out loud together. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. Yes. Amen. Sure. Amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. While the instruments come, while the songs are coming, thank you, Father, for your love for us, which is unconditional, never ending, always accepting us without reservation, taking us back, taking us in, delivering us, filling us, satisfying us, freeing us, healing us, giving us rest. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you, our gracious Heavenly Father. We love you. Maybe you're here and you're dissatisfied with life. You know what that feeling feels like. You've wandered through your existence longing for something to satisfy your hungry and thirsty soul. Everything in the world will try it. Seem to have any promise of satisfaction has disappointed you and left you on a lonely road. Would you be willing to come to the altar of prayer and cry unto the Lord in your trouble? If you're willing to come to him, he'll lead you in the right way. He'll satisfy and fill your hungry soul with goodness. Would you come? Just come. Just come. Maybe you're here and you feel like a prisoner. Pressures of life, you feel so weighted down, maybe by the habits of your flesh, the thoughts of your mind, the attitudes of your heart. Maybe it just seems like hard labor just to even get up out of bed in the morning and go to work, just even to live life is just a labor. More than anything, you wish you could be free. Or would you be willing to come to the altar of prayer and cry unto the Lord in your trouble? He'll break the chains of your life in two, save you from your distress. Would you come? Or maybe you're here and you have deep wounds in your soul. I don't know. Maybe it goes back to your childhood. Maybe it goes back to a deep betrayal of your trust. And that emotional stress and trauma has, has just taken over your life and you could even call yourself dysfunctional at times. Well, God has sent his word to heal you and deliver you. If you'd be willing to come and cry to the Lord in your trouble, would you come? If you need to deal with a sin problem, you can come and always be accepted by God. Would you come? Maybe you're here and you long for rest. Oh, you're just Maybe you've never known God in a personal way as your Savior. We can show you Christ if you'd come. Or maybe as a believer, you're just out on stormy circumstances and just be thrown to and fro, up and down, just overwhelmed. You come to the Savior. If you've never trusted Him, you can give your life to God. If you have trusted Him, you need to renew that commitment. Cry to the Lord in your trouble. Find a safe haven of rest and wait on the Lord there. Would you come? Brother uh, Robert, what number do we have? 157, the love of God. 157. Thank you. 
today. And tonight we're going to continue our study uh, on uh, the keys to personal revival. Let me ask you to come back. And let me also ask you, if you live in an area where some of our elderly that can't drive at night because of the time change, especially if it's raining, and you could swing by, they want to be in God's house so in, on the evening service. They want to be here to hear God's word. They know that God's word brings healing. So they want to be here. Amen. And if you can give them a ride and bring them, set that up, talk to them, and say, I'll be glad to stop by. Let me swing by, pick you up, bring you to the house of God Amen. in the evening service. I want you to be here. We all sit in that center section and give us a congregation going on in the evening uh, section. And so I want you to be here tonight for the next uh, edition of Keys to Personal Revival. Now also, just before we dismiss, this will be our dismissal prayer. But we'd like to have a, a special prayer uh, for Operation Christmas Channel, where uh, we have we are sending these boxes out all over the world. Uh, we're sending them to uh, the Samaritan's Purse there. They put, wherever they're going, they put a gospel track in there in the language of the people that we have uh, reached out to and gave these gifts to, especially the children. And uh, I was talking to Trey a couple of days ago. Always, always remember time of the year when we come when we come to this time we we have these boxes that go out and remember about I don't know seven eight years ago um, there was a terrorist attack in uh, Chechnya or Serbia we used to be Czechoslovakia whatever and, and they went in and, and killed a bunch of children in a school and then when the investigators went in and, and saw that terrible uh, mass murder that they found in several of the places in that school the Operation Christmas Child boxes, the empty boxes, and maybe even some of the toys. And some of the, those children, before they were killed, had an opportunity Amen. to hear about God's love and Jesus Christ. Amen. Always think of that when we send these out. When they send. over 200 again this year, over 200 boxes that we are sending out, and that is 200 souls that we are touching for Jesus Christ. Amen. And may, may each of those children just, uh, with the excitement of receiving a gift, uh, may they also receive the greatest gift of all, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're going to have we're gonna have a word of prayer here, we, and uh, we've got a picture there of, uh, of uh, Sonia and Lee and all the girls, and seen this picture, but uh, uh, they, that God has burdened their hearts. They, they usually uh, put in a, a good lion's share of our, of our sending uh, these boxes, and so uh, we, we really appreciate what God is doing and blessing them to be able to do this, and, and, and we all get the credit for it because they're part of our family. We all share in what God gives here, so let's pray and, and just ask God to, uh, uh, to take each one of these. Heavenly Father, we do pray the mighty name of Jesus Christ that each one of these boxes with gifts, washcloths, toothpaste, and maybe some small toys and pencils and things that children might need in school, that, that these gifts would be received by all of these children and the families of which these children are part. And they would say, why are they giving me these gifts? And they would reach into the box and they would see a gospel track that clearly explains the free gift of Jesus Christ that God gave to the whole world. And that they would see and realize that the Holy Spirit would move in their hearts understand that God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life and at that moment may they receive Jesus Christ into their hearts may they be a light that shines in their family and then in their village and then in their township and in their 
country. I pray that you would take this little that we are given and that you would break it, multiply it, and that you would bless it. And that your name would be glorified. Thank you, Lord, that we are able to be the givers in this transaction, so to speak. And that we are not in a poverty-stricken nation where we don't even have shoes to go on our feet. Thank you, Lord, for using us. It's all for your glory and all for your honor. We pray that the gospel would reach hearts everywhere in the strong and matchless name of Jesus Christ. All of God's people in agreement with my prayer said,